welcome to the Worship of God on the sixth Sunday after Pentecost as we join to celebrate our Lord's resurrection and our life in Him and life together. Uh, not a lot of, about to say. Um, you know, we, we, we blocked, uh, we kept this driveway blocked over here. Uh, we made a decision because I, uh, one Sunday I was sitting here and this huge boat, pontoon boat, and I'm on leading worship. I see this huge thing come through. And um, so the decision was made to do that for liability's sake and all that. Well, I guess someone was not paying attention or maybe just decided it's going to be a throughway. And so they run through this gate out here, chain, pull the whole thing out of the ground. So we're not sure who did it, but someone is bearing the signature of it, I guarantee you that, because they pulled the concrete post out of the ground, didn't they? I mean, geez, hit it with, with some force. So um, so if you see that out there, you'll understand. <laughs> and if you know who did, who done it, <laughs> pass it along if you will, please. You just never know, do you? Um, <clears throat> we continue to pray for Kathy Merrill and uh, I'll be with her and this time. I know it's been a long journey, it continues to be to be one. And um, please note those that are listed in the the prayer concerns and if you would lift them up in prayer and also um, send them a note of of compassion and care if you would. Uh, Wayne Fairchild is still a little bit under the weather so we'll continue to pray for Wayne. His, uh, his hip is still a concern so he's not with us today he would be here if, if he could uh, but it's not mobile as he'd like to be to get around so um, anyway i think that's that's about it that i have but welcome to worship let's get to it <laughs>
say a few words. We come together today uh, to seek out the living God, but importantly, for the living God to encounter us. That's why we come to church. I mean, that's why we're here. And when we do the brief order for confession and forgiveness, you know, it's easy to get just as a matter of road, but it, you know, with, in my relationship with Rebecca, her relationship with me, there are times when we need to say to each other relationally, I'm sorry, <laughs> will you forgive me? It's the same as we do our confession and forgiveness here as we come before God, the living God who encounters us to <laughs> engage in that relationship and to recognize that we fall short of who, who God calls us to be and uh, how God asks us to serve and to love and to give. So I just wanted to lift that up for you. And then the rest of the service is just the unfolding of all that. It's God's, the liturgy itself is, is a God's choreography given to us through the ages, through centuries. And the best we can do is to engage in the liturgy and worship and get out of our own way so that the liturgy itself and the dance with the holy is live here together. <laughs> Would you please stand for the brief order for confession and forgiveness? We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and go into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and solely by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 556, Morning Has Broken.
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ, and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. reading is from Genesis, the 18th chapter, beginning at verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may be refreshed, and after you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took herds of, and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And they said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Here in Sereni. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. They do not slander with their tongue, they do not do evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They have sworn upon their health to do to not take back their word. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. <coughs> the second reading from the first chapter of Colossians, beginning at verse 15. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil things, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to, pre to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, providing that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised of the gospel that you heard, which I has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, 
to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Here is the reading. Thanks be to God. Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel lesson? That's memory all now. Yes, okay. Good. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now, as they went on their way, they entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from him who was, who is, and who is yet to come again, Jesus the living Christ. Amen. In the lesson we just heard, Jesus, we are told, is welcomed by Martha into her home. Uh, certainly Mary's there. We don't know about Lazarus. You know? We don't know about their brother. We don't have any clue about where he might be. But he, Jesus must have shown up early. Or was, he showed up totally unexpected. Because otherwise, Lazarus would be there. You know, you just think about, well, where is Lazarus and all this? Well, you know, to receive him, uh, all of them would be there. But Martha is up and doing, working to make things right. She's working hard to make things just so for her guest. I, I think I, I call it spick and span. Let's get it right. You know, let's get everything cleaned up. And she's making sure everything is in its proper place. Martha looks at Mary and says, Deadbeat sister, <laughs> basically. Here I am doing all the work. And here you are sitting at Jesus' feet. Jesus, won't you do something about this? <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, it was radical that she was even doing that. It was countercultural. Uh, men were the only ones supposedly taught or supposed to be taught by rabbis in that day and age. And much less, it was taboo for a woman to be as close as she was and in the posture that she was uh, with Jesus. So there's a lot going on in this text and this particular event. And then uh, the dialogue itself. You know, Martha is fed up, basically. She's needing some help, feeling burdened by her work. Not only does she say that, uh, say, that, don't you care, Lord? Tell her to get up, tell her to help me, basically. Or perhaps she's envious of her sister's privilege, uh, which she would not dare risk to take. Or perhaps she is challenging Jesus' countercultural behavior uh, with her sister. It could be she's resentful of her sister's behavior and, and instructs Jesus to tell her to pull her own weight around here. But Jesus' response is direct and very much to the point. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. I want to look with you at this lesson and specifically focus on Jesus' response to Martha 
to see what we, we might learn for the living of our own lives. First of all, Jesus challenges Martha's worry about many things. The Greek here means to be full of cares, to be anxious. Now what we have is in the English version is that of anxiety or worry. Now, it comes from the Middle English, verin, of worrying or verbin, which means, now I get this, to be anxious and to worry. Out of the Middle English, it means to choke, to choke, to strangle, or to bind, or to squeeze, to press, to push. And in the present context of Jesus being with them as a guest, her worry has robbed her of truly being a welcoming host. Now, when we worry about something or we're anxious about something, our focus is on that and that alone, and it can be rather disorienting for us. We get so wrapped up, as she is, in our own worries, that she is not open and available uh, relationally to Jesus. Now, we all know the truth of this. I mean, psychology and certainly brain research has shown that when we are anxious as human beings, that our entire uh, awareness and the options that we have available to us are narrowed, choke again. You know, it, it takes really takes a lot of our life out of us. It robs us of being able to access what makes us distinctively human, and that is that of reflection, of logic, of cognitive processes, and of making decisions. Uh, because when we're worried, we're emotionally engaged. And if we're overly emotionally engaged, then we lose our left prefrontal cortex, our availability, our left prefrontal cortex. And we basically are not living out of our humanity at that point in many ways. We actually are choking the humanity out of our lives in many ways. That's just an aside. That's some of the healthy congregation stuff I plan to do with you all in the future. But uh, you know the truth of that. When you're, when you're concerned, um, you can't think clearly. You can't, you can't uh, consider and think through all of your options. You may not even be able to identify it. But um, anyway, so Jesus recognizes that she is troubled. And she's under stress. She has many things on her mind. And uh, about spick and span and getting things right. And also a little angry at her sister. Um, the lesson says that Martha welcomed him into the home. But did she really? She's not relationally available. Because the availability of her heart and mind and presence are elsewhere and are scattered. And she is literally choked up. She's strangled by her worries and is under a great deal of stress. You ever been strangled by your worries? I have, certainly, you know. To live in this world, there has to be some level of anxiety or worry. So Jesus is not talking about doing away with all that. Jesus is talking about in the moment with Mary and Martha, what is happening. So. Uh, she's chosen the one thing. Well, let's, I'm going to take a, just a brief look at worry uh, in our culture today. Very brief. Um, studies have shown that money, work, and economy continue, the mo continue to be the most frequently cited causes of stress for Americans. And can you say COVID? <laughs> uh, I mean, really? And it continues, uh, does it not, with BA4 and BA5 coming on the scene these days. We, we just we just don't know. Uh, I read an article this morning about about all this. And could you anyway? So that's a source of concern and worry for us all. Uh, significant sources of stress beyond that certainly include money. Seventy five percent say that work. Seventy percent. I would think these days the economy it was sixty seven percent. This was a study done in the uh, two thousand fifteen. So it's been a while. But um, I can see 
particularly with the economy, everybody's wondering what it's going to do. Are we in a recession or not? And what's the future going to be? No one truly knows, but it's enough to worry you. <laughs> then there are family health problems, personal health concerns. That's 53%, both of those. Job stability is 49%. Housing costs, 49%. Personal safety, 32%. We have a lot to worry about, don't we? And we do. We certainly do. Um, the effect of that is that Americans report irritability or anger, fatigue, lack of interest, lack of motivation or energy, headaches, upset stomachs, a change in appetite. And then there are proportions of adults, you know, in relation to those stressors. Uh, to engaging in unhealthy behaviors, self-medication, for example. Oxycontin is not, uh, didn't come on the scene just out of nowhere. I mean, in this culture of, of high stress and worry, uh, that is uh, certainly uh, an unhealthy behavior, unless it's absolutely necessary for medical reasons and it is monitored very carefully. Also, research shows that prolonged periods of stress release cortisol, the hormone cortisol, and that can decrease proper cell function, contributing, contributing to numerous emotional and psychological disorders, including depression, anxiety disorders, heart attacks, stroke, hypertension, immune system disturbances, which all increase, which do increase our susceptibility to infections. So I want to broaden what Jesus says a little bit more here. Uh, I'll talk about being distracted here in a moment, but distracting means what? Splintered. And literally, the etymology of that is to be splintered. And so we become what? Splintered internally as well, biologically. So there's a poem I think that captures the stress in our in our life these days. It's uh, the time of the mad Adam, a T O M Adam. This is the age of the half red page, and the quick hash, and the mad dash, the bright night with the nerves tight, the plain hop with the brief stop, the lamp tan in a short span. The big shot in a good spot, and the brain strain, the heart pain, and the cat naps till the spring snaps, <laughs> and the fun's done. <laughs> wow, for sure. Jesus, in his conversation with Mary, reminds her that there is more to life than worry and anxiety. There's more to life than being troubled about many things. Jesus wants us to know how we can manage our worries. And he knows that we do have them. But he also wants us to realize that the worries do not need to have us. And that's the key. He points to Mary's example saying, there is need of only one thing. That is in this context, with me present. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word chosen here is key. Jesus reminds, reminds Mary, reminds Martha, both of them, that we can make a choice regarding our worries and our troubles. Jesus reminds us that we can sit with the Lord and we can come to the Lord with our worries we can come before him and in his presence to simply be with him to know him to know his presence and his peace Martha's worry prevented her from welcoming Jesus or truly being with him and I think in this text we need to remind ourselves of the better part. We need to remind ourselves of the need to be in relationship with Christ and to make ourselves wholeheartedly available 
to that end. Jesus does not cast any aspersions upon worry. It's about Martha and her attitude. Worry is just part of being human. He doesn't say you shouldn't worry. Again, it just reminds her of the choice that we can make as we deal with our worries and our concerns in this world. We know all too well that we can't just sit and pray all day and expect to have a roof over our head and eat and drink and be with family. We can't do that. But we are reminded in this context where we have the contrast of two sisters, which is really, I think it provides at least some mirror to our own world of being so busy and about the things that we need to think and to know the choice we have in managing our anxiety, our worries. There is that old favorite hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus, right? All our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? Well, all because we do not carry everything to the Lord in prayer. And that is so true. Well, the other thing is, Jesus recognizes Martha's state of mind. You're worried and distracted. Now, the English word distracted means to turn aside, to divert, to draw or direct one's attention to a different object in different directions at the same time. You ever been there? You know, like, you know, certainly. Or to stir up or confuse with conflicting emotions or motives. Martha's mind and heart are literally divided. In fact, the old archaic use of distracted means insane, <laughs> mad. <laughs> wow. So Martha's mind is overwhelmed with many thoughts and concerns related to her work. She is not singularly focused. Mary is. Mary has her fixed gaze on the Lord and is open, receptive, attentive to her Lord. reminded that we don't need to be so distracted we can make choices about that you know as Americans we are just we are preoccupied with our work and did you know the United States has the longest work week of any industrialized country in the world it does 52 percent work over 40 hours 41 to 49% 11%, 50 to 59, 50 to 59, 21%, and 60 plus 18%. That's the, the numbers on that. I've been in that latter group before. It's no fun. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have too. Indeed. Gordon Dahl in his book, Work, Play, and Worship in a Leisure-Oriented Society, is quoted as saying, most middle-class Americans tend to worship their work, to work at their play, and to play at their worship. I think that's well said. So Jesus does not reprimand Martha for her work as much as he does for her preoccupation with work. And that causes her to be distracted. It causes her not to be able to focus. It causes difficulty not only you know, with herself, but also with her sister. <laughs> well, we all have heard the saying, all work and no play makes Jack a very dull boy. Jesus is saying to Martha and to us that all work and no pray or praise makes us a very shallow Christian. So Jesus challenges Martha. Jesus challenges us to establish some balance between work and worship. We are challenged to establish some balance between doing and being to establish some balance between the attitude of willfulness that gets things done and the attitude of willing openness and receptiveness that welcomes and joins others in community. Jesus challenges us to establish a balance between a faith that is active in love. After all, we do say what the EOCA is God's work, our hands. That's not all of it. It can't be, according to this text, we need to have a balance between God's work in our hands and a faith that is centered 
in and renewed by God's presence and God's word. The two inform one another in many ways. Jesus tells us there is need of only one thing as we worry with the cares of this life and as we are filled with many thoughts and concerns related to our work and the demands on our time. We need to be mindful. We need to give much needed time to choose the better part, to be, to know, to love, to converse with our Lord and with one another, with one another. A wonderful text in Colossians about us being the body of Christ in the world, and so we are. We can't be the body unless we are one with each other, indeed. Well, there will be a time, we know this, there will be a time when the cares and concerns of this world will, will come to an end. There will come a time when the fevered pitch of work will also come to an end. However, the relationship with our Lord, his care, his presence, his peace, and his power cannot and will not be taken away from us. So what would Jesus say of you this morning as you look at your life and assess this call to balance? This is a question for you and a question for me. People of God, will you choose the better part? Amen. Please stand as you are able and join me in hymn number 754, Jesus, the very thought of you. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, creation, and all in need. Ever present God, in Christ you fill all things. As your church gathers to hear your word, share your meal, and receive your blessing, teach us to welcome strangers 
as we have been welcomed by you. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. <clears throat> Through Jesus, you created all things, invisible and visible. Teach humankind to honor and protect all creation, including living things that remain hidden from our eyes, such as air, atmosphere, molecules, and microscopic creatures. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. Through Christ, you reconcile all things. Motivate those in power to end enslavement, dehumanization, or brutality of any kind of protect, uh, to protect and improve the lives of indigenous peoples. God of grace, hear our prayer. Through Christ, you bring peace. Assure all who are worried and distracted by many things of your constant presence. Soothe those suffering in mind, body, or spirit. And sustain all who are afflicted. Especially we pray for Beverly, Glenn, Ruby, Cliff, Anne, John, Wayne, Judy, Anne, Rachel, Susan, Alice, Megan, Kathy, Donna. Also be with those who are grieving as we continue to lift up the family of Gary Laxton. God of grace, hear my prayer. In Christ you made your word fully known. Inspire this worshiping community to abide fully in your word as we sit at the feet of Jesus. Bless the ministry of teachers and Bible study leaders. God of grace, hear our prayer. In Christ you brought forth the firstborn from the dead. We give thanks for the saints you have gathered at your table. Gather us with them in your eternal glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. O God of every time and place in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we confidently entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. Also Let us share the peace of Christ. Your soul, your 
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field. And equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his birth, death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be our honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now we pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, power, and glory. Forever and ever.
Would you please stand? May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal, you have provided for us the better part. Indeed, you have encountered us. You have tended to our needs and our wounds. You have fed us with your love and your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 838, Beautiful City. Thanks be to God. Have fun, man.